We begin with an important topic of giving someone power of attorney. If I can't be there to be a litigant uh, for myself and, and plead on behalf of myself, um, can I uh, ask someone else to do it? Uh, we would normally think of a power of attorney as a normal thing, that in, basically it's an agent or a messenger, a shaliach. And we're going to see that Avashir will have such a concept. Uh, but we're going to start with the Amre Nehar the sages of Nehar uh, who have a different concept that in order for you to represent me, I I actually have to make you the litigant. So I actually have to transfer the thing that I'm trying to get, the money or the item that I'm trying to get, I have to transfer you to you the ownership of it so that you can now become the new litigant. So now say, This document of authorization, called an urcheta, um, you cannot write that about with unmovable property, only on land, but movable property is a problem. So Rav asked Amemar, what's wrong? How come the, the rabbis of Nehar say that you cannot make this power of attorney document uh, for a movable item? And the answer is because of what Rabbi Yochanan said and this halacha that we've already studied. If someone steals an item and the uh, the owners have not yet despaired in getting it back. Um, and so now the thief has it in his possession, but it's still owned by the original owner. Neither of those two people can make it a hikdesh, can consecrate it. The thief cannot because it doesn't belong to him and you can't consecrate something that you don't own. And the owner also cannot because it's not in his physical possession. It, the, the thief has it, and therefore neither can do that. Well, how is that relevant to this? As follows, just like you can't concentrate, consecrate something that you own but is not in your possession, so too you cannot transfer um, control and ownership over something even that you own but is not in your possession. So in this case, the owner, some guy owns a watch. He gives it to a watchman to um, to uh, uh, hold for him, and then he comes to claim it, and the wa- and the watchman is like, oh, what watch? I gave it back to you. You never gave me a watch, whatever. He's denying it. Now, the owner doesn't have time to deal with this, or he's in a different country or whatever, so he wants to appoint an agent, a lawyer, to deal with it for him. According to Nehardeah, the mechanism is, not, it's not just a shaliach, the mechanism is that the owner will transfer ownership of the watch to the lawyer. But in order to transfer it, you need the actual item. Because Rabbi Yochanan says, we're assuming, just like Rabbi Yochanan says, you can't consecrate an item that you own if you don't have possession. So too, he would say that you cannot uh, transfer ownership of an item, even though you're the owner, if you don't have it in your possession. And therefore, there is no way to make uh, this document of authorization for a movable ab- uh, for a movable item uh, be- that's not in your possession. That's one version of what Nehar Da'a said, a different version that does not makes no reference to the Biochanan. So this is nothing, it's come totally different. It's just still a limitation on when you can um, make this kind of authorization. In this version, we're adding another word. Uh, one cannot write this document of authorization if it's movable uh, property that is denied, right? If I... Um, I have this watch and I give it to someone to hold for me and he denies it. And so now I I no longer can make this document of author, of authorization. Why? Um, be, the, uh, because this, it looks like falsehood. Since we don't really know, does this watch exist? Does who who has it? Who owns it? Where it is? Since it's in doubt, the entire the whole the whole, the whole matter is in doubt. When I say when I write a paper and I say I transfer to you the lawyer the ownership of this watch and all responsibility for it, but that sounds like a document of transfer or sale. But this the item uh, we don't really know if it exists. So yeah, maybe it does, but right now it's still in doubt. I mean, no, that's why you're trying to hire a lawyer to figure out in the first place. But since it is in doubt, therefore, it looks like uh, something false. And uh, therefore, you cannot do it. Only if uh, everybody agrees. Yes, yeah, I gave it to him and he ex- he knows it exists. I just, uh, you know, can't deal with the paperwork right now. Then you can write one. So if, if, as long as there is no denial, 
right? The the watchman or the debtor, whoever it is, he didn't deny it. Yes, I owe you the money, and I just want to have someone represent me to go through the motions of collecting it or doing whatever needs to be done, uh, then it is possible to transfer. And so according to this, this would not be according, this would not agree with Rabbi Yochanan in this version, because um, Rabbi Yochanan would say you can't, doesn't matter, there's no way to transfer some uh, movable item. According to this, you can transfer a movable item even if it's not in your possession. The only problem would be if there's, um, if there's a denial, uh, then you can't. All right, now back to the Nahar Dea, they say another halacha. Amri Nahar Dea, or cheta de la keti be zil don uzchev a pek le nafshach let be meshasha. We actually have the formula that you have to write in such a document, and such a document of authorization that doesn't have the following phrase in it that says, go and don, and do you, do you take legal action, and you can merit and uh, collect this for yourself. If you don't have that phrase, then it's not a valid document. So you see how powerful this is, right? Basically, I'm, even though I own the watch, I have to transfer all rights to you. You can go, you can go to court, and you can, you can collect it, and you can keep it. Now, the hope is that if, you're, if you are successful, then you'll give it back to me because you're doing this, uh, uh, after all, for me. But technically, during, uh, technically, it's yours, right? You're collecting your own money. That's the only way you can represent me. It, it can't be a, just um, an, a legal fiction as if you're me. You have to be the actual litigant. You can only be the litigant if you're collecting it for yourself. And so I'm saying, yes, you can collect it for yourself. Why do you need to do all this? Because the other litigant, uh, the the watchman um, will say, "Well, you are not uh, you are not the litigant of, of me, right? Who are you? You're a stranger." Um, he has a right to say, "I only want to deal with the person who is suing me, who claims that this watch is his." Uh, then then I'll I'll come to court and deal with them. But some stranger who has nothing, a third party, uh, who has no cause here, I don't have to deal with them, and therefore I have to make that other person the litigant. So, see, we're not really recognizing this kind of legal fiction that a lawyer somehow represents me. The lawyer has to be the new owner. Amar Abaye, Viketi be le mechsal de shalish rabi amigo de mishta'e dina apalga mishta'e dina kula. Beza says, listen, when you transfer ownership to the lawyer, you don't have to transfer the entire amount. You could transfer half, a third, a quarter, right? Some percentage. Um, and that makes him enough to be a, a rightful litigant. He has a, he has a claim. Uh, he has, he has, he's a claimant. And since he can go and make judgment for part of it, so he can make judgment for the whole thing, right? If you have, a, a, you know, 10 partners in an item, not every partner has to show up to court to argue the case. One of them can, and then if they show that they're, they're right, and uh, they all uh, took a loan together or deposited something together. So then, once one wins, then they that then all of the, all of them can collect. So you don't have to transfer the entire amount to the lawyer, but you have to transfer some. You have to give uh, him some share of it in order for him to be a litigant, uh, a, a valid claimant. A consequence of this is that if this lawyer guy uh, goes and grabs the item for himself, then the real, the original owner cannot take it from him, right? Once I say, this is my, yes, my watch, I gave it to someone to deposit, I authorize you to be a lawyer, all right, but I have to transfer um, all, part or all of the ownership to you. If you, the lawyer, go and take, win the, and are able to get the watch out of the watchman, then you decide, this is a nice watch, I'm going to keep it, I, nothing I could do about it, right? I'm just, I'm going to hope that I pick someone that I trust will be a friend and will um, give it to me back after, but I can't make them. Rav Asha has a completely different understanding of the power of attorney, and this is more like we would think of it today, um, that as long as you write, the uh, original owner writes, I accept upon myself anything that develops, mit ane, any, anything that you will respond, any responses you give to to the court, anything they tell you, anything, any decision that you say, I accept upon myself. As long as I give you full authority to deal with the case as you wish, then that is a shaliach, and I don't have to transfer ownership to you. You represent my decision-making power. 
that is totally valid and I don't have to transfer it to you. So that's Rav Asher. Uh, but another version, some say not Shaliach, but rather Shutaf, that you are my partner. Um, so this would be a follow-up to uh, similar to Abaye, but in here I don't have to give you a percentage. I could just say, you know, I own I own it all, but you have full decision making. That's also like a like a partnership that you are um, even if I own it, you're the decision maker, and uh, so that becomes a partner. Now, what's the difference between being a shaliach and a shutaf? Uh, difference would be to seize half of it. If when I appoint this lawyer, he is just an agent, then the agent cannot seize it on and, and keep it. Right? He's only my agent. If, he, if he's able to get the watch, he has to give it to me. Uh, however, if we view him as a partner, well, that's more like what we said before, like Nahar De'an, like Amemar, um, that it's, uh, it, since it's a partner, so you the lawyer who sees it can keep half of it and then it gives me the other half and the final law is shaliach right even though we spent more time talking about um than the harda nevertheless Rav Asher and this first version yes you can actually make a, uh, a power of attorney who represents you and even though they have no ownership they're simply an agent Good. Next Mishnah. Ganav al pi shenayim ve tabach u machad al pihem o al pi shenayim acherim meshalem tashlome arbaa va chamisha. Uh, someone stole something, and there's two witnesses that saw that saw that. Right? Witnesses A and B. We'll call them. And then uh, afterwards, the thief uh, slaughtered the animal or sold this animal, the ox or the sheep. Um, and they, or the same two uh, people witnessed that also, Miss, Mr. A and Mr. B. Or maybe uh, it's two other witnesses, Mr. C and Mr. D. Um, either way, the thief has to pay four and five times. In other words, it doesn't have to be. It can be the same witnesses for both the thief and the, and the slaughter, but it could be two different sets of witnesses. We'll talk about the chidush that, of sp- splitting testimony. Can you have two different uh, sets of witnesses? Uh, testify about um, two uh, about a crime or two parts of a crime. Ganav umachal be Shabbat. Ganav umachal avodah zarah. Ganav be tabach be yom hakipurim. If the thief, uh, in all these cases, one has still has to pay four and five. If someone st- uh, uh, stole and sold an animal on Shabbat, or he stole and sold it uh, uh, to for the sake of idolatry, or stole and slaughtered it even. Um, uh, sold it or slaughtered it on Yom Kippur. Now, in all these cases, he has to pay four and five, even though he's violating other laws as well. So notice that the the um, the language is exact. If he would uh, steal and slaughter it on Shabbat, well, slaughtering an animal on Shabbat is one of the melachot, Torina melachot, isur de oraita, uh, liable to the death penalty. And so if he would do that on Shabbat, since he's liable to the death penalty, we apply kim leh bedarbamine, he only gets the bigger punishment, which is the death penalty, and therefore does not have to pay man- money. He does not have to pay four or five since he did the slaughtering, and this is the very same act of slaughtering as... Uh, both violate Shabbat and um, triggers a four and five, and therefore, since he can't get both, he only um, he would only pay, uh, he only get capital punishment. That's if he slaughtered it. But selling, buying, and selling on Shabbat is not capital punishment. It's a gezerah that you may come to write, but uh, if you don't write, then it's only a gezerah. Uh, therefore, it's kind of surprising that what we think of as work is business trends. Most people, all right, uh, businessmen are working and uh, buying and selling, uh, we think of that as work, but actually in the 39 Melachot, it's only actually creating, doing something that creates something new, and buying and selling uh, is not one of the 39 Melachot. Since, although it's prohibited to, to sell something on Shabbat, since there's no capital punishment, he does have to pay four and five. Also with Avodah Zarah, if he would do Shechita, if he slaughters an animal for Avodah Zarah, that's liable death penalty, and he would not pay four and five. But simply selling an animal for avodah zarah is not. There's no death penalty, and therefore he has to pay four and five. Yom Kippur, even whether he sells it, that's for sure. And even if he slaughters it um, on Yom Kippur, if someone violates does melacha on Yom Kippur, um, they get karet, but not. Um, a death penalty in the hands of a court. And since there is no death penalty, even for slaughtering on Yom Kippur, um, he also has to pay four and five. Right? That's um, 
important that really the holiest day of the year people think is Yom Kippur, but Shabbat is more stringent than even Yom Kippur. And so in all these cases, there, since there's no death penalty, there's no Kimle, uh, Bedr and one has to pay four and five. If someone steals a sheep from his own father and slaughters it or sells it, and then his father dies such that then he will get the inheritance, or he and his brothers, if he has brothers, get the inheritance, he still has to pay four and five uh, because um, he stole it and slaughtered it, slaughtered it when the father is alive. So therefore, yeah, even if the father dies, he has to pay into that four and five to the inheritance, which will then get split um, uh, between him and his brothers, but still he has to pay. If he slaughtered it, uh, uh, stole it and slaughtered it, and then made it Hekdesh, he has to pay four and five because at the time that he slaughtered it, it was still not Hikdish. This is uh, in contrast to the we saw in the previous Mishnah that if he steals it, then it becomes Hikdish. And we discussed either he makes it Hikdish or the owner makes it Hikdish, whoever. If he steals it and then it's made Hikdish and only then he slaughters it, he does not have to pay four and five because you don't pay four and five to Hikdish. But here he slaughters and he steals it and slaughters it before Hikdish. He's already liable to pay the owner. And the fact that it makes it hekdesh after does not change that. In these all, all these cases, one has to pay four and five, even though one cannot, one uh, does not intend to or cannot eat the flesh of the animal. So if someone stole and slaughtered a sheep. But he did it for medicinal purposes. Even when he wants to take the meat and, I don't know, put it on a wound or something. Or he's, he's going to feed it to the dogs. So it's not for human consumption. So even though he did kosher, he did kosher slaughter, but the slaughter is not to make it kosher. It wouldn't matter for him if it was not kosher. Or if he slaughters it, you know, a, a, a kosher slaughter, but then it turns out that there's a problem uh, in its lungs or whatever, and it's terefa, so it's not kosher. Or he does a, he does a normal shechita, but it's an unsanctified animal, and he does it in the Bet HaMikdash, which is also not allowed, and makes it, makes it un, uh, inedible, and makes it not kosher. In all these cases, even though the slaughter is not for the purpose of of getting kosher edible meat, um, nevertheless, he still has to pay four and five. Just the act of doing a slaughter, um, see, you don't have to pay four and five if you like throw it off the uh, a cliff or just kill it in another way. You only have to pay the four and five if it's if it's a proper ritual slaughter. And so, as long as a proper ritual slaughter, even if it ends up not being kosher or you don't intend to eat it. Doesn't matter. You still that still triggers the four and five. However, the Bishimon Poter Bishne Elu, the Bishimon disagrees with the last two. He agrees in the first two because the first two you're doing ritual slaughter, even though you meant to feed it to the dogs. Technically, it's kosher. You could eat it. You could change your mind. Uh, you you meant to use it for me, for medicine, but you could eat it. So this is a kosher slaughter, and it doesn't really matter what you attended. You made kosher meat. The second two, the Bishimon says that um, uh, he, Rabbi Shimon says, not, not only here in general, that um, uh, a, 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 something is called uh, shechita only if it successfully uh, creates kosher meat. Um, uh, but if for some reason, let's say it's a terefa, then the shechita is not called a shechita, even though if you look at, take a camera, right, it looks like the same thing from the outside, um, he's doing the same, exact same act, but if it turns out that for whatever reason it's not kosher, either because it's terefa or because it was done in the wrong place, um, and it's not edible, that's not called shechita, and therefore the Bishamon says you don't have to pay four and five in these last two cases. The Gemara now comments on the first case of two witnesses that say we saw he stole it, and a different set of witnesses say that we saw him slaughter it. It seems that our Mishnah cannot possibly be reconciled with Rabbi Akiva, because Rabbi Akiva quoted the Pasuk that says, You need two or three witnesses to attest to a matter. So that means it has to be a full matter and not half of a matter. In other words, Rabbi Akiva is saying you can't have um, two different sets of witnesses, uh, both, both come testify 
testify about two parts of a sin. You need one set of witnesses to talk about the entire sin. For example, uh, you can't have one set of witnesses come and say, we saw this guy eat half a kezayit of pig. And another two set of witnesses said, we saw him eat another kezayit of pig, a second one. Uh, right? There was two on his plate. One saw one, one saw him eat the other. These two things do not combine. Uh, in order to hold someone liable or to prove something, you need the one set of witnesses to say both. And so here, according to the Biakiva, it seems you would need one set of witnesses to see the entire crime from the theft to the slaughter in order to make the person, the thief, liable to pay four and five. And here you have one set of witnesses for the theft and a different set of witnesses for the slaughter. And so you cannot combine two different sets of witnesses for one crime. And therefore, the Biakiva cannot be reconciled with our Mishnah. De Tanya, Amar And now we have the source for when where, where the Biakiva actually says this principle. So this is Rebiose says, this is Rebiose ben Halafta. So he's talking about his own father, Abba Halafta, went to study with Rebiochanan ben Nuri. Or some say it's the other way around, this Rebiochanan ben Nuri went to study Torah with Abba Halafta. In any case, uh, one said to the other, we're talking about making a hazaka on a piece of land. If I um, am, am sitting on a piece of land and I, I use it, I uh, it's a field and I, I plant and, and um, take from the, the produce of the land for three years in a row without anyone um, uh, uh, challenging my ownership of it, then that is a proof of ownership. As long as I have also a claim, I claim that you, know, I, you bought it to me or you, you uh, gifted it to me. And look, I'm here for three years and no one ever protested. So then I don't need a deed or any other proof. But uh, first you have to be there for three years and you need witnesses that in fact you were um, there and you that that you uh, ate the crop right you um, you benefited from the crops uh, that it grew um, all three years so here we have a case where there's two witnesses that say yeah I this guy lived there for one year and the second set of witnesses say that yeah, this guy lived there for uh, 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 another year and the third come and say you know year number three we saw him there but these are three different sets of witnesses um, what about that case so this is these two sages are asking each other Amalo Harezo Hazaka and Bachalafta or said Biyachodamnidi or the other way around said that works right because you have one testified about year one another testified about year two another testified about year three so yes we can combine multiple testimonies together and now we have a full proof and the other colleague said, I agree with you, but Rabbi Akiva does not, because uh, he said uh, the, that um, one set of witnesses has to testify about the entire matter, the entire proof. If it's like a case like this, you need one set of witnesses to say, we saw this guy live there and eat from the crop all three years. Or if it's a sin, you need one set of witnesses to, to see the entire um, act of the sin, and you can have one, uh, uh, these two witnesses do half, and the other two witnesses do half. And therefore, our Mishnah must not be the opinion of Rabbi Akiva. This is no, I can say even Rabbi Akiva would agree in this case of the Gonev and Shohet. Uh, because Rabbi Akiva agreed in another case as well that is simil more similar to our case. Two witnesses say, this man and woman, they did Kiddushin. And then, right, they did the ring ceremony, good. Now they're, right, they're, they're, they're Mikudeshit. And then the second set of witnesses said, we saw that this couple, the same couple, uh, did, did Bi'ah, meaning for Nisuin. Um, now these are two separate ones. Can we combine them together and assume that they did Kiddushin and Nisuin? Right, there are consequences if there's, um, if there's only Kiddushin or if there's also Nisuin. 
Um, so uh, yes, yes, we can. Even the Biakiva would agree that we can combine these two sets of witnesses. Why? Because even though the second set of witnesses for Bia, they rely on the first set of witnesses. If if a West of witnesses come and say we saw this man and woman, they had Bia. It doesn't mean they're married because uh, them them having intercourse. If there was no kiddushin before, that's that's meaningless. There's no there's, this could be biat zinut. Um, it doesn't mean that they um, that they're they're married unless we know there were there was kiddushin before. So the second set of witnesses needs the first set of witnesses. However, the other way around is not true. The adek kiddushin don't need the second set of witnesses. They are a standalone testimony that has significance. Two witnesses that say. We saw the ring ceremony. This man and this woman are mikudeshet. That has a lot of legal significance, legal significance by itself. So therefore, that that stands alone. Since that part stands alone, therefore, the Bia, and everybody would certainly agree with that, right? And then even the Biakiba would agree that the other half can also stand alone. The Debiya can be a different set of witnesses. You don't then need them to be the same. Right? Because this is Davar, Karina Be. They're testifying to a whole matter, the Kiddushin, and therefore the Nisuans for Nisuin is now it's a, a separate matter that it can be separated from the two. Unlike the three years where um, testifying that someone uh, sat on the land for one year has zero halachic significance, right? In no case does that matter. And therefore, right, that, that cannot add up to more. But as long as the f- one part of it is, is standalone, then the other part can be a second set of witnesses. And that applies to our case, our Mishnah as well. Even though the witnesses about the slaughter witnessing a slaughter by itself is not a crime right so i can we can uh, i can slaughter animals all day maybe i'm a butcher maybe i'm slaughtering my own animal that does i wouldn't have to pay four and five just because his witnesses that saw me slaughter an animal the witnesses to the slaughter are only significant if they uh, come after witnesses that that say I stole it. So therefore, that's not standalone. However, the other way is standalone. Witnesses that come and say I stole this uh, ox, that by itself is a crime, and therefore it's standalone. It's significant in and of itself, and certainly those witnesses that uh, that are significant, they can be separated from. The second set of witnesses that say that I slaughtered it. Um, so therefore, even if Akiba would agree that since one part of it is standalone, so too the others uh, can be standalone and do not have to be the same set of witnesses, right? That's called Davar. And it's good. This is great. So now our Mishnah is not only the Banan, can also be the Akiva. But now that we quoted this source for the Bi Akiva, but Abanan Hai Davar, Velo Hasi Davar, Lemeote Mai, Rabbi Akiva used the word Davar to say t- half of a half a testimony about half an act is does not count. What do the rabbis use this word for, right? Would, would, wouldn't they also agree that some some kind of half an act is not good, but it's not the cases we were talking about because they, Rabbanan say, three year, th- testimony about three separate years does not add up together. So what would they exclude? If you have testimony to see if a girl has, is a minor or has become an adult, you, uh, we have to see if there are, she has two hairs. Uh, normally, uh, a, even one woman can examine her and see if there's two hairs. But there are some cases where you need two valid witnesses to see uh, to, uh, uh, to testify about this. So one uh, witness uh, says, I saw one hair on her back. It's a euphemism for her privates. He saw from the back. And another one said, I saw her, I saw one, only one hair on her, on her belly in the front. Uh, so uh, these, uh, 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 this does not count. Even Rabbanan, who say you can combine two, uh, two uh, sets, uh, separate testimonies, but in this case, you cannot combine them. Before we explain that, first we have to say, wait a second, is only one witness to one hair and one witness to another hair? Hi, chasi davar v'chasi adutu. This is not only half of a matter, it's also half of half testimony. There's only one uh, witness to each. So no one thinks you could combine uh, two uh, witnesses 
what that each saw different things so that can't be that that, that can't be what it means rather we have to mean it must mean Echad may means one pair, right? Said, but so let's change that to mean make it clearer. Two witnesses said we saw one hair on her back. Two witnesses said we saw one hair on her front, um, and that also does not count. Now, how come the rabbis? What, how is this case different from? The one, uh, the the one before. How come the rabbis say over here you can't, you can't, you cannot add them together? But for the case of three years, that you can add them together. And the answer is, it's fundamentally different here, where uh, oh, two sets of witnesses say we saw one hair. They're not. Uh, they're not just. Uh, n- not only are they not testifying to something significant because one hair is not significant. It's actually the opposite. Testimony that she has one hair is testimony that she is a minor. Right? She's saying, "Oh, we saw one hair." That means she is a minor. And so you have actually two sets of witnesses saying she is a minor. So that doesn't add up to the to uh, testimony that she is an adult. Right? It's two witnesses. Two witnesses that that are actually saying the opposite of what we the, what we are trying to prove. That's the Different from the years where, um, okay, you come and said that once everyone says uh, we saw this guy be squatting on this land for one year. Okay, that doesn't prove that they own it, but it's not against that he owns it. Could be he's the owner and he's there for one year. So in that case, they can add up to make a full case. Here, the t- testimony by the by itself is actually a negative testimony, and that's why even the rabbis would not. Uh, would, uh, would agree, even the rabbis would agree with you, Akiva, that in this case you do not add, add them up, and that's what they do with the word davar velo hasi davar. They also apply it in cases like that. We now move to the next clause of the Mishnah: Ganavu machar be Shabbat. If someone steals and sells an item, a a ox or a sheep. On Shabbat, he does have to pay four and five because this violation of Shabbat is does not require the death penalty. He only sold it, as opposed to slaughtering it. Okay, so now we have a baraita v'hatanya patur. We have a baraita that says the exact same case. Ganavu machar be Shabbat, and it says he does not have to pay four and five. Why not? Uh, so we're going to see a couple of different answers of scenarios. We have to come up with a scenario where selling a sheep on Shabbat is going to violate uh, the oraita and require the death penalty and therefore would not have to pay four and five. So answer number one. Amar Rami Bar Hama. Ki tanya hi de patur ba omer lo akos lecha te'ena bi te'ena ti viti kani li genebutich. So the thief comes to a buyer and says, hey, would you like to buy this sheep that I that I stole uh, recently? And the buyer says, yes, I would like to buy it. Um, and here's how I want to make the transaction. This is on Shabbat. The buyer says, you see that fig tree over there that I, uh, that I own? Go and pull off a fig and take it for yourself. And through that, I will acquire the ox. Uh, this is probably a Kenyan Khalipin, a symbolic exchange. And so then the thief goes ahead and does that. Now, he is violating Shabbat de Oraita, which requires capital punishment by picking a fig off of the tree. And that very same act is also making the acquisition of the sheep and uh, enacting the sale. And there you go. That's a case where if one stole an animal and then sold it on Shabbat through this type of mechanism, he would be liable to capital punishment and therefore not have to pay four and five. That's the case that this Baraita, this is Patur, was talking about. But the rabbis rejected. They said, says, This sale itself would be invalid because, let's say, it came to the Betin, right? Let's say the thief did not deliver the um, sheep. Um, at that point, and then this buyer came to court and said, ah, this guy, this thief, he sold me the sheep and he even plucked a grape off the tree um, uh, in order to uh, to enact the sale. So the sale is final and he has to give me the sheep. And then the rabbi said, okay, when did this happen? He says, oh, on Shabbat. He says, what? He plucked the tree. He plucked a, pi- a fig off the tree on Shabbat. So the, the Betin will not tell him go and pay because instead they'll say, 
take this thief and give him capital punishment for violating Shabbat. And since the it would it would not be a collectible sale, you could not collect it in Betin, therefore the sale is invalid. I mean a sale that you cannot enforce is not a valid sale, and therefore there's not it's not it's not a case of uh, uh, of a thief that that uh, stole and sold the um, the the animal because the sale never went through. papa. So we have a second answer. Don't forget the first one. We're going to come back to it and revive it. papa. Give the second one. lo This guy, the thief, stole a sheep. And he comes and says to a buyer, hey, you want to buy this? And it's on Shabbat. And the, the buyer says, yes, I would love to buy it. Listen, you're in the Shut Arabim over there. You're in the street. Just take the sheep, throw it over my fence into my yard, and I will acquire it in that way. Now, by throwing it into the yard, he is violating Shabbat, Midoraita, is transferring something from the Shut Rabim to the Shut HaYachid. And so it's the very same act of transfer of ownership is also violate Shabbat, and he gets the death penalty. This is the case that the Baraita was talking about, where it said that the thief does not have to pay four and five. Okay, brilliant. But now we analyze Keman, says so this answer is fine, but it will only work according to the Biakiva, who says that when something enters into the airspace of a of someone's yard, it's as if it's at rest. You see, for Shabbat, in order to violate transfer, you have to not only transfer, but also put it down. It has to be Hanacha on the ground. So the rabbis uh, say, the majority against the Akiva say, that has, if you throw something into a yard, one is not liable to vi- uh, 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 violating Shabbat until it lands in the yard so that there's a transfer and landing. But Rabbi Akiva says, no, once it enters the airspace, it's as if it landed. So yes, according to Rabbi Akiva, this works because when the thief takes this poor sheep and throws it up into the air over the fence, as soon as it enters the land, the airspace, he violated both Shabbat and the sale as uh, is, uh, the transaction um, happens at the very same time and therefore he's liable death penalty and he doesn't have to pay. But according to the banan, once it enters the airspace, Entering the airspace, even the Rabbana would agree that, that that is an acquisition. So he acquires it at that moment. And then, uh, two seconds later, when it lands on the ground, only then does he violate Shabbat. So since it happens at two different times, we do not apply Kim Lebed Rabamine, since it was, not at, it was not one act at the same time, but rather uh, they um, happen sequentially. Uh, so according to Rabbana, he would have to pay Four and five, as soon as it enters the airspace, that's it. You're liable to that. And then when it lands, then he's liable to the death penalty. So yes, he gets the, the thief would get death penalty, and he would have to pay four or five, according to Rabbanan. Um, but the Gemara says, no, we can explain this even according to Rabbanan. It's when the buyer made a stipulation and said, listen, I, I want the acquisition not to be not to happen when it enters my airspace i want it to only uh, register when it lands and see so if you make that met that stipulation that's fine and that works and then even according to the banan where the thief throws it in only when it lands is he liable to both of violating Shabbat and making the acquisition, but since Kim Leod Rabamine, he only gets the death penalty and does not have to pay. That's the case that the Baraita was talking about. All right, good. That, all that is Rapapa's answer. But now Rava Amar Leolam Kerami Barhama. Rami Rava and Rami Barhama are often at odds with each other. It's nice to see here that Rava is helping out Rami Barhama and he says, Et, uh, et na nasra Torah. Uh, Rava says, what was your problem with Rami Bar Chama's case uh, where he says, pick a fig on Shabbat um, and that way uh, one will be liable. Your problem was that this sale is not collectible. And you said, if a sale is not collectible in Betin, then it's not a valid sale. But that's not true. I'll give you another case of something that's not collectible, and yet we, we still consider it a, 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 a sin and a valid transaction. And here we're talking about etnan zona. If the, the payment, if someone, uh, a man goes and, and pays a zona with 
uh, with a sheep. He gives her a sheep. That sheep is not permitted to be used as a sacrifice. Um, right? At Nan, the, the price to given to a zona is not, uh, is not allowed by the Torah. And uh, that would apply even in a case where a son gives a sheep uh, like this to his mother. Um, uh, so try not to imagine this, but um, right, if uh, a, a, a man, a, 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 a son and a mother are together and she is the zona here and he pays her with a sheep, um, this uh, the sheep would still be prohibited. Um, it's still at, it's in a, it's still at in at non zona. Now let's say the son doesn't actually give the mother the sheep. He promises it, but then um, he doesn't deliver, and she comes to court and says, "Oh no, my my son, he uh, he owes me a sheep." And the the betin says, "What are the circumstances?" She explains the circumstances. They said, "What you did that? You're deserving of capital punishment, and you cannot collect the sheep because you get capital punishment." Right. So the betin. Would would so would the betin say give her give her the animal? They would not say that. They would instead take her and him to be killed. Um, yet even even so, uh, still that sheep itself is still prohibited um, to uh, to sacrifice um, uh, because it was right. It was given or promised or, or um, they did have to do. They did some kind of transaction, and uh, it was uh, therefore already at Nanzona. So you see that a sale or transaction, even if it's not collectible in court because of a technicality never uh, um, of uh, of that the, the person is going to get capital punishment nevertheless the transaction is a valid transaction and so too um, back in our case and the when the uh, person is picking the uh, fig um, and he says well okay that this is a transaction and then he goes to court to get the say that he bought and the and the court would say wait well, he doesn't have to pay because he gets capital punishment um, even though he, the, the court cannot collect it. Nevertheless, it is a valid sale. Now explain further, right? And so in that, in the case of Etnan, even though when the mother uh, brings a claim against the son in, in court, it says, you know, I want that say payment. We do not say, oh, you have to give it to her. Instead, we give him capital punishment. Nevertheless, um, uh, that which he, which he gave her is considered an etnan and one could not sacrifice it. So here too, even though regarding actual payment, if the buyer comes and says, I want my say that this guy acquired by taking my fig, um, even though when it comes to court, we do not tell the thief, go and pay, because he gets capital punishment. Nevertheless, since you did do an active acquisition, that is a valid sale. It's true, it's not collectible in court, but nevertheless, it's a valid sale. And therefore, um, when, uh, one uh, would be liable to four and five uh, a payment, uh, except that, if he also violated Shabbat on the Donata level, then he would be he would not have to. But it is a case of Mechira that we have to give the Chidush that although he stole and sold and did a valid sale, nevertheless he doesn't have to pay because he also gets capital punishment. Baruch Adonai Amen